without further ado, I'd like to begin and welcome everyone to our free webinar series, right? Today, we're going to be going through how to stay centered amidst the chaos, developing a practice of resiliency through appreciative strategy. I want to thank Charlene uh, Suko for uh, be great, being gracious enough to facilitate this workshop or this webinar today for us. Charlene is one of our many individuals in our Florida Atlantic University family who has embraced appreciative advising and appreciative education into not only her professional life, but into her personal life as well. So without further ado, I would like to pass the mic on over to Charlene to kick us off. Well, hello, hello, everyone. Just want to make sure that everyone can hear me. Give me a thumbs up if you can. Wonderful. Thank you. Thank you so very much for joining me today. Um, I am just thrilled to be partnering with the Office of uh, Appreciative Education to bring this content and uh, tools to you. Um, so Jenny and Amanda, thank you so very much to you and your awesome team. Couldn't have done this without you, much appreciated. A little bit about myself. Um, professionally, right now, I am the Director of Strategic Initiatives here at FAU for the Division of Administrative Affairs. And this division has a number of units that have university-wide impact and influence, like university police, emergency management, uh, facilities management, environmental health and safety, and a host of others. And so within the last just over two years that I've held this role, I've really been able to bring strategy to the forefront in a way that I wasn't able to do in, um, well, previously. And so I actually was introduced to, to Jenny and Appreciative Education last year prior to COVID, just prior to COVID, and then reached out again this year to see what kind of opportunities and how could I learn more about Appreciative Education. I ended up taking the six-week summer uh, course in Appreciative Administration, and I had a blast. If anyone has, has the opportunity to take it, I, I totally support it. Um, so then, uh, so that's uh, strategic initiatives. But then about 10 years, uh, for a 10 year span, I led the emergency management function here at FAU up to um, establishing a department of emergency management. And this is where I really got the opportunity to dive into that macro level resilience, that organizational level resilience, and to leverage systems and strategy and capital to get that done. And then prior to that, for about five years, um, was it was my first foray into resilience within the health department, within the environmental health section. But personally, I've been delving into self-awareness, self-discovery for as long as I can remember. And whether it be reading up on uh, or studying Western and Eastern systems of healing um, and self-awareness, or other systems and other frameworks really through profound personal work, transforming vision into practice and creating open hearted connections and partnership. I've gained so many tools and created a methodology that I employ for myself and then within my professional life and really all around um, a methodology and a process to nurture a happier, healthier and more purposeful me. And within the last five or six years, as the um, field of neuroscience became more available to the general public, especially with applied neuroscience, I began to delve even more deep of my, I, I, I love science, my, my formal education uh, is in science. And so I, I really just began to delve into that to get an idea of how does the brain really work and how do these neural pathways and systems really inform and drive what we do? And again, like I said, the appreciative education model and its interactive and transformative process truly aligns with this, truly aligns with that practice of resilience through appreciative strategy. So let's get into what I say the yumminess. And uh, first up, we're gonna meet up a little bit. We're gonna jump into a room introduce yourself, you know, your name, where you're from. And then I want you to answer a burning question that has 
um, a lot of components of what we will discuss today. So answer the question and then in a few words say why. And that burning question is, is a hot dog a sandwich? I kid you not, that is the question. So is a hot dog a sandwich? Answer the question in a few words, you know, tell, tell everyone in the group why you think it is. Uh, we'll be there for about two to three minutes and then I'll meet you back here. Hopefully you had within the technical difficulties and everything, I hope you had a chance to at least ponder, if not discuss and give your, give your opinion as to whether you think is a hot dog sandwich. And, and, and I'm just gonna throw this out there. How many of you were curious? Uh, you never really thought about what defined a sandwich and you were tempted to look it up. Some of you actually did <laughs> look it up. Um, you know, how many of you had firm opinions and answers, like it was yes or no, and this is why? Um, how many of you, even if you had those firm answers, you thought, well, you know what, why do I even think that? Do I need to actually think about it some more or, you know, reflect on it? Um, how many of you disagreed with others, their answers, but were, were curious and open enough to listening and learning more? And so this is actually what we're going to be talking about today. We're going to jump into, and this is how our, how our time today is going to flow. We're going to look at the brain. There's a biological, more specific neurological basis to resilience and strategy and appreciative strategy. So we're going to look at the why. And then we're going to flow into the what. What is resilience? What is appreciative strategy? And what makes appreciative strategy so important to cultivating resilience? And then we're going to start exploring some habits that underpin that framework. And these are also championed and celebrated throughout all phases um, of the appreciative education model. So from disarm all the way through to don't settle. We, we see these employed here. And this is more of the how. And then we're gonna look into what are some of the tools, the day-to-day -to -day tools to cultivate those habits and practices. So it's, so, so it's just, it's more of the how, but also it can be about the when and the where. So that's how our day is gonna flow. So, so why, why focus on the brain? Well, it's the powerhouse of our vital functions, our respiration, our heart rate, our circadian rhythms, our fight, flight, fright. Um, processing sensory information and, and our more higher cognitive, uh, cognitive functions like learning, planning, and strategy. And so we're going to drill down more into why it's important to understand that game and that brain, um, how, how the brain works. And so we'll focus on three main areas, even though there's so many more pathways and, and sub-processes within the brain that actually feed into um, appreciative strategy and resilience. And the first one is that emotion and memory formation. Um, when it comes to memory formation, there are many areas of the brain that actually tie into creating memories and creating from moving short-term memories to long-term memories. And some of those pathways deal with facts, they deal with events. There is a specific one that processes emotions such as fear, it's called the amygdala. And memory formation and learning from fearful experiences. And this is important because this is going to speak to why we might not become appreciative, why we might not become strategic because of fear. Um, also the default mode network, what is that? It's the balance between how we see ourselves and our internal world and external focused attention. So it's related to like self-related thinking and processing, thinking of others and putting ourselves in the context of social and everything external. It's also about wandering. When your mind wanders off, how many times have you zoned off in a meeting or in class or something along those lines and you're just gone? Uh, that's that default mode network in play. And then we're looking at the cognitive functions that those executive functions, decision-making, uh, conflict monitoring, planning. 
Um, when it comes to self-regulation, to be able to purposefully direct your attention and behavior, to suppress inappropriate knee-jerk responses, to switch between strategies and be flexible. In order to do that, you have to be able to understand different views, different viewpoints, uh, become more multidimensional in your thinking. And then of course, the reward system, motivation, whether it be intrinsic or um, extrinsic motivation. And any object or event or activity can be a reward if it motivates us, if it causes us to learn or, it, or elicits pleasurable feelings. And so this is where we, we will focus on and talk, talk about um, intrinsic motivation. And by leveraging all of these systems and more, that becomes, that happens when you, you will become uh, more um, involved, more practiced, and that's where your competencies come in. And this is where you find your strengths. So the question moving forward into resilience and appreciative strategy is how do we actively and purposefully engage our brains so that it works for us? It works for us as, as we are today. Are we gonna do it through fear or are we gonna do it through possibility? And so remember the hot dog, is a hot dog a sandwich? It wasn't too long ago, so hopefully you do. You haven't drifted off um, default mode network, but uh, one of the models that actually describes the process by which we create our subjective world, our internal representation of the world, um, is called the NLP communication model. And this was created back in the 1970s by Bandler and Grinder. And it's predicated on, we have so much information coming to us. It postulates that we have about 2 million bits of information a second just hitting our senses. And so we couldn't possibly process all of it. So we use filters to organize it and to make it more familiar and to make it make sense. And by doing that, we're able to then create this internal representation of our world that becomes our subjective world. And then we engage in behaviors that reinforce it. So what are those filters? Well, the way that we organize all of that information that's coming in is in three ways, according to this model. We generalize, we distort, or we delete. Generalizing, you kind of you you're always going to use words like always, every time, everyone, never. And once those generalizations are created, we organize our lives around it, it tends to become our beliefs. And then we hold on to them even when contrary evidence is available. The next one that we might do in order to organize is distort. And that's a process by which we actually change our perceptions of the information that's coming in. And so we change our experience of it. And one, one way that we can do that is called cause and effect where you tend to make connections where there is none. So I don't know how many times you've, you've said it or you've heard someone say, you know, I didn't get to work on time because of rush hour traffic. Well, no, you probably didn't get to work on time because of time management, not really because of rush hour traffic. So that's one of the ways that we tend to distort and that can actually feed into blame game at times. And then the next one is deletion. That's where we cast it aside. We selectively pay attention to certain dimensions of our experience and, and exclude others. How many times have you said or heard someone say to you throughout the course of your life, well, my way is better. They're not even taking that into account. They have completely put whatever you've had to say aside. And so because this is one of the models and the framework to better understand how our subjective world is created, the question now becomes, what are we overlooking? What important information are we disregarding? And what would it mean if we actually paid attention and took that information in? So and that's where the idea of resilience and strategic thinking has come in. But before we do that, let's get into one of those practices that actually get you there. And this one is called a progressive relaxation. So I want everyone to get comfortable, kind of like just sink into your chairs a little bit. I want you to close your eyes. And this is really something that you can use 
when you can when you have five or 10 minutes or a bit longer and you just want to come to center all right so like i said get comfortable in your chairs close your eyes and then just begin to focus on your breath normal pace breathing here the only thing that's changing is your focus bringing it to center and bringing it to your breath. And now I want you to move your focus to your brain. And on this next breath, breathe in, focus on your brain, and then on your exhale, let go and tell your brain to relax. As you breathe out, bring your focus to your neck and your shoulders and inhale. Feel your core fill with beautiful breath and exhale. And as you do, tell your neck and shoulders to let go and relax, be at peace. Now bring your focus to your arms, all the way down to your fingers. Inhale. And as you exhale, tell them to let go. And feel them just begin to let go, to be. Now bring your focus to your chest. And inhale. And as you exhale, let go. Tell your chest and everything within to relax and be. Now down to your belly. Inhale. And on the exhale, just release. and feel everything begin to just sink into peace. Now to your back, inhale. And on the exhale, tell every single muscle in your back to just let go. And exhale. And now to your hips, inhale. And on the exhale, let go, tell it to let go and it will obey. And now to your legs, all the way down to your ankles. Inhale. Bring your focus to your legs and release on your exhale. And finally to your feet. Inhale. And on the exhale, just let go. And in one final breath, just your entire body, just inhale. And on the exhale, just let go, relax and be at peace. Now slowly bring yourself back to present and open your eyes. How was that? Thumbs up, anyone? That's a really quick way. And like I said, if you have a longer time, you can um, focus on on uh, smaller parts of your body and just make it a beautiful 10 to 15 minute experience. Um, those who are part of today's webinar, who are also part of my weekly meditation, we use this all the time to, to come to, to peace, to come to center. So let's talk about resilience a bit. And the definition of resilience is the capacity to recover quickly from difficulties, its toughness. The, the physics definition of it is the ability of a substance or object to spring back into shape and elasticity. 
And notice that I've highlighted keywords, recover, shape, elasticity. Recovery or springing back into shape does not mean that it stays the same, that there's not change or adaption, whether it be internally, neurologically, uh, ne neurologically physiologically, it does not mean that. If you look at tree rings, tree rings paint a story of its history. When the tree is cut down or when they bore into it and take a look at the tree, tree, tree rings, if weather conditions are favorable, the growth rings tend to be wide. But during periods of stress, whether it be prolonged drought or pestilence, growth rings tend to be thinner than years before or after. Summer rings differ from spring rings. The tree looks the same for all intents and purposes, but it is not the same. And so when we look at resilience and what concepts and words we want to bring in or it, a resilience embodies, it's agility, it's adaptation, it's learning, it's transformation, it is challenge, above all, it's curiosity. And so what it is not, it is not staying the same. There is this idea of the dark side of resilience. We've heard it so much within the last year and a half. And it's not giving up in terms of making a change for the better or getting out of that situation that no longer serves you. It's not about being strong and powering through bias or prejudice or unsafe or hazardous conditions or going back to the way things were. That is not resilience. When it comes to strategic thinking, which underpins appreciative strategy, it focuses on creating value by enabling provocative and creative dialogue. Could be at an organizational level or at an individual level. It's creating value through possibility. And you can't be provocative and creative without being curious, without being aware of the information that you might be missing or overlooking and what your subjective world looks like, or even without reflecting upon how best to create given the circumstances or context. So when we think about strategic thinking that underpins appreciative strategy, immediately, these are the concepts, these are the ones that come to mind. Appreciative, multi-stepped methodology, process, environment, inclusion, collaboration, above all curiosity, seeing a, seeing a, a, a thread here, innovation, agility, all of these things. It's, and this is the way to actually prevent that dark side of resilience as it provides the environment for you to ask yourself and others, in this phase of your life or circumstances, what are you overlooking? What are you disregarding? What might happen if you no longer overlook or disregard it? And then how would you be able to apply that to enhance your life, to enhance your unit, to enhance your organization? And when we talk about creating that value, which is appreciative strategy, this is where these are the uh, facets of strategic thinking and appreciative strategy. And it's really that long range of value creation. And it's the whys and the hows and the whats and the whens and the where. And first off, when we talk about creating value, we have to be able to bring some objectivity within our objective world, bringing in that information that we've disregarded or overlooked. And so it really is about setting aside those undue influences of personal experience, interpretation, or bias. It's also about doing things in a multi, uh, a multiple time frame or step time frame. So you see that logical sequencing of synthesis. It's about systematic thinking, understanding dependencies, your upstream, your downstream, your resources, your capital to leverage. It's also about effective collaboration and cooperation. And finally, last but certainly not least, is understanding the influencing factors, your current environment, and reconciling and integrating those connections and influences. And we see this every day, especially in job interview questions where 
the whole point of a job interview is to see whether we're that individual or we, if we're, if we're the ones interviewing, if we create value. So for those who deal with uh, students on a day-to-day -day basis, advisees, coaches, mentees, um, career, um, the, the, the career units within institutions, even with uh, you know, student employees and stuff, when that comes in, how many of you have, have thought about the objective analysis, the question of what is your greatest strength or what is your greatest weakness? That's actually a way to see if someone is objective enough to be able to recognize that about themselves. As far as the logical sequencing, well, where do you see yourself in five years or, or 10 years? And well, of course, anyone asking that four years ago would not have you know, anticipated a global pandemic, but nonetheless, this is another question that actually prompts that can you add value? Do you add value? Systematic thinking, uh, when you're given a scenario and asked, what would you do? So understanding dependencies, resources, and capital. Uh, stakeholders, uh, who are the important stakeholders within this uh, position or job and why? And then finally, for your influencing factors, when you ask what trends are you following in whatever field or industry that, that you might be in or that you are actually interviewing for. So when you think about this, this you can, you can bring that and you can bring that in a more um, defined way, refined way to, 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 your, to your audience. But here's the other thing, here's a bit more provocative thinking. How many times or, or what might happen if you ask yourself these questions today? If you start a practice of asking these questions every so often, what great things might you find? And I said last but not least for the influences because they really do impact how you think and your belief systems and your core values. And influences can come in many different shapes and forms. You have the economic, the environmental, geographical, societal and familial, that's a big one, origin, uh, race, gender, religion, um, for an organization, legal, statutory, regulatory environment, and then demographic. And I actually pulled this out because I wanted to focus on the concept of generations and multi-generations um, within the workplace, within your families, within whatever uh, setting or circumstance you might find yourself in. And this is really important because this is archetypal and it describes a collective way of being based on all of the above influences at that particular point in time for that generation. So their values, uh, the technology that they leverage, how they communicate and how they prefer to communicate, how they view the, the work environment and organization, uh, organizational hierarchy, all of that comes to play in a collective archetypal way. You know, for Generation Z, which is 23 years and younger, they're the, the ones at the very top, they're going to be coming into the workforce, uh, you know, pretty soon. And what would that mean as far as what they're influenced by and how that can be leveraged moving forward to bring great benefit to your organization or even, you know, to, to yourselves to learn from them. And so we practice and you practice resiliency and employ resiliency every single day throughout the course of your day. It's not just about the big things, not the significant anxiety inducing or life changing things. It's about navigating that meeting that you're going to have to present for or that email that may bring some stress or that advisee or parent or coworker that may be defensive or disengaged or accusatory or frustrated. You know, it, it, it could be new policies and procedures in place, uh, new policies and procedures. We've, we've, we've seen that recently with our return to campus and to or, you know, our organizations and institutions after COVID. Um, new technology adoption, reorgs, adapting to that multi-generational environment. This is all ways that we are challenged and that we adapt and that we are resilient and we employ strategy. 
And so doing so in a manner that leverages you and your team strengths and seeks opportunities to de-escalate, to educate, to meaningfully redirect and realign, you're, you're in, in, by, by being able to do that successfully, you're advancing the mission, your mission, the, your team's mission, uh, your institution's mission, and that's the strategy. It's about adaptation through collaboration, challenging those influences that no longer serve you in the way that you need them to, uh, provocative possibilities and persistent curiosity. So let's do another exercise here. And this one is really quick. Uh, people use the term quick and dirty. I'm gonna use quick and clean. This one is if you just have like one minute or two in between like meetings or, 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 or meeting with your advisees or whatever it may be, and you just really want to just come to center, we can get this done. So here we go. So this one is a breathing exercise. And first things first, I want you to put one hand over your chest and you probably can't see because the camera is not low enough and then one hand over your belly. All right, and kind of sit back and kind of get a little comfortable here. And so I'm gonna take a breath and you're gonna see hopefully that my hand has not moved or moved, moved quite a bit. Here we go. Now I did that so that you could see that I actually did take a breath, but my hand on my chest did not really move. And what this is called is diaphragmatic or belly breathing. It's one of the real quick ways that you can engage that nervous system and that neural pathway to actually downregulate your fight, flight, fright, any anxiety inducing situation you can engage that neural pathway to calm yourself down. So here we go, one hand on chest, one hand on belly. Try your best when you take your breath to fill your belly. All right, here we go, inhale. And fill as much as you can, as full as you can. And then exhale slowly through your mouth and deeply. and squeeze at the end. One more time, inhale. Feel that belly fill. It's okay if you're not used to it that your chest moves as well, it's fine. Hold and release. One more time, inhale. Feel that belly fill, hold and release through your mouth. Let's do it one more time. Inhale. And fill that belly. Make it full and round. And now exhale. All right, so we're gonna go back to normal stance normal pace breathing here. This is something that if, if you can do it, you can probably make get about six breaths into one minute. And that's a really good way. It actually targets your, your neural pathways so well um, that it's one of the most effective ways to actually bring yourself down from a heightened or anxiety inducing state. So let's talk about the habits. Now, these are patterns that actually shape our everyday lives. And it's the behaviors that we see in our external world. And at the deepest level, whether it's at the organizational level, within yourself, within an advisee, with, with an advisee or someone else, these carry you through all the phases of the appreciative education model from disarm to discover, dream, design, deliver, don't settle. And habits are deep rooted. They show up in different ways depending on the context. And if you try to develop it through one pathway, it either won't work or it won't be broad enough. It'll feel like work every single time and it won't be authentic. So if you try to cultivate, and what, what do I mean by that? If you try to cultivate leadership within your workplace, 
but you don't cultivate it within your home life, maybe being a parent or being a friend or some other type of um, environment or circumstance, it won't be authentic because habits start at the trunk. They manifest in various areas of your life. They actually, if they're deep, deep rooted, they start at the core, they start at the roots. So it's really about not temporarily adopting anything. If you're trying to become a leader at work, you must become it in your life. And they're so deep rooted that they become, the habits are, grow stronger and stronger over time. They become hard, hardwired. This becomes your default network that we talked about in the beginning. This becomes part of your subjective or internalized world. So as context changes over time, they must change as well. The idea of this is the way I, or we've always done it, and I'm sure many of you have heard that in some way, shape or form throughout your lives, that inevitably fails. And there's a multi-billion dollar industry on habits and on cultivating good habits, habits that will serve you. So one of those main habits, and there are three that we're gonna talk about today, is curiosity. Being the eternal student, that perpetual curiosity. And there's new research conducted by Gruber, Gelman, and Ragnath uh, in 2014 that provides insights into what happens in our brains when curiosity is peaked. So people who are highly curious to find out the answer to a question were better at learning that information. When curiosity was stimulated, there was an increase in activity in that circuitry in the brain for reward. We talked about that intrinsic motivation earlier. And then curiosity motivated learning. So there's an increase in the formation of new memories. And here's the thing though, experience tends to stymie curiosity and impede learning. And so uh, De Stefano, Gino, Pisano, and Stas postulated that once someone has gained a certain level of experience, it's better to deliberately articulate and codify what has been learned because any more learning is not going to be that beneficial. So just think about that. That's, that's something to ponder on. The next habit is cultivating self-awareness. So Dr. Tasha Urich conducted 10 separate investigations with nearly 5,000 participants and examined what self-awareness really is and why do we need it and how can we increase it? And they really um, found two types of self-awareness. One is the internal self-awareness. How clearly do we identify our internal mapping, our purpose, our mission, our value, our behavior, our sense of belonging? And then the external self-awareness. How do others view us? How does our external environment react to us? And so self-awareness is not just one truth. It's a delicate balance between two distinct, even competing at times viewpoints. And when it comes to, when you look at the matrix that we have here, you have external awareness at the top and then internal awareness at the side. And those who have low external and low internal tend to be seekers. They tend to be, they tend to not know who they are and what they stand for. And a lot of times you find these in people who are now entering the workforce, students. Um, and, and so those are the seekers with low external, low internal. High external and low internal are your pleasers. They're focused on pleasing everyone and appearing in a certain way, to, really to the detriment of themselves. You can also find these in younger, the younger generation, but you might also find it in your, your colleagues and those you know, within your family, within your personal sphere. The introspectors tend to be those who are a bit older, experienced, um, a lot of managers, not all, but a lot of managers tend to fall into this where they're clear on who they are, but they don't really challenge their own views. A lot of uh, those who are higher CEOs and stuff, they don't have a lot of people at the top to give them meaningful feedback. And those who are below them don't want to be a fear of consequences. So those are your introspectives. And then you have those that are 
entirely aware, very appreciative, understand learning, understand constant curiosity and, and, and are very self-aware. And so what happens when you don't cultivate self-awareness? Well, you don't know your blind spots. You don't know when your emotions or your influences are distorting your thinking. You don't know what you know and what you don't know. You don't have an accurate sense of your strengths and weaknesses. You can't accurately assess social cues. You can't judge the effectiveness of your communications and you cannot practice the essential function of self-regulation. So, and then another habit, the final one that is really good to cultivate is your reflection. And in the autobiography of a yogi, one of my favorite books, um, he says, aversion to instant acceptance is really only honoring the principle of due reflection. We live in a world where everything has to be immediate, where we need instant gratification. There is something to be said about stepping back, reflecting. And there's been research conducted in call centers, and the results have demonstrated that Employees who spend 15 minutes at the end of their day reflecting about lessons learned, well, they perform 23% after 10 days than those who didn't reflect. But there is an aversion to engaging in due reflection. And that aversion to the process is because of we're in this fast paced, instant gratification mode, slowing down, becoming curious dealing with the messiness of the whole thought process and taking personal responsibility. There's also a lack of understanding of what dislike for the results where you dismiss your strengths and become hyper-focused on your weaknesses and then it paralyzes you. There is a bias towards action and only recognizing tangible moves as an indication of productivity or creativity and an inability to then measure those tangible products. But here's where those of you who have heard of the SOAR model for strategic planning, your strengths, your opportunities, your aspirations, your results, this is where this can actually help. Because of that results uh, piece of it, that gives you the ability to think about how would I measure intangible productivity or creativity. So reframing to positivity, but also with results. So let's talk about developing that practice. And these are your day-to-day. -day. You can decide what you wanna do, when you wanna do it, how you wanna do it. And here are some key ones. And so we've already practiced some of these throughout our time. So I'll start with the first one, journaling and writing. Now, earlier I mentioned that once someone has gained a certain level of experience with a task, that the benefit of learning more is actually less than when you deliberately articulate it and codify it. So that is so important. I actually practice this year round at the um, end of a new calendar year. I sit and I reflect on what my experiences, what lessons I've learned, what I need to be thankful for. I also do that um, the day before my, my birthday. And in between, I also do that as well. It's really a wonderful practice. And like I said, by articulating and codifying it, there is great value in you being able to analyze it and then create from it. With the breath work we talked about, there's a myriad of ways that you can practice breath work, not just the one that I showed you. And of course, meditation as well. And then paying attention. So I don't know if you recognize that in one of the, especially for the meditation, I talked about coming gently back or coming or focusing on your breath. One of the ways that you can actually stop your mind from wandering and for zoning out is to gently, when you recognize it, bring your attention back to the present, bring your attention back to your breath. It's a very gentle way to bring yourself back. And then radical gratitude. I cannot speak more highly of this. Last year, 
I was very, very uh, ill at the beginning of the year and the doctors didn't know what, what the issue was. And I experienced great anxiety from that. And gratitude is one thing. And I didn't have the tools, the tools that I had in my toolbox just didn't seem to work to, um, or, or, or work well. And I began to practice what the healing community knows as radical gratitude, being grateful for every single thing around you, animate, inanimate, sentient, non-sentient. So I remember getting up in the morning and thanking my pillow, thanking my, my bed, my sheets, my blanket, as I, as I became vertical, tanking the rug, the floor, the, the walls, the roof that, that covered me and kept me, kept me safe. It is a, an amazing way to bring yourself to the immediate present. And so you can practice this when we're done with the webinar. Just look around, thank, thank the chair that you're sitting on that is actually supporting you right now. You know, thank the desk, thank, thank whatever is in your immediate space. It's a wonderful way to bring yourself back to present and to attention. And while you're doing all of these day-to-day -day practices to cultivate those habits, here's a way to further cement it even more. Ask questions, provocative questions, like what is my mission? What are my passions? What brings me joy? What's my greatest influence on how and why? And are they still serving me? This is something that I use almost every single day. I constantly ask myself, what lessons are in this experience for me to learn and how can I incorporate them moving forward? What skills and capabilities can this situation or experience help me develop or refine? And finally, provocative of all, is the question in what context or circumstance could my weaknesses become strengths? Think about that. Everything is context, context, context. And here we have it, the why with the brain, the what resilience and appreciative strategy, the how with the habits, and then the how and the whens and the where with developing a practice. Everyone, thank you so very much for joining me today. It has been an absolute pleasure to share this. And thank you so very much to the um, OAE staff for affording me this opportunity. Thank you all. Thank you, Charlene, and thank you all for joining us. Again, we're delighted that you could be here. As a reminder, we will be sending out the PowerPoint uh, to you within 48 hours, along with a link to the recording. Um, in the meantime, Ashley has placed in the chat a link to an assessment. We would love to get some of your feedback on this session before you have to hop on and get on to your next meeting. I do know that there was one question that was asked, and so I wanted to take a moment, Charlene, and ask that question of you, and it comes comes to us from Beth Tremeling. What would be an example of deliberately articulating and cauterizing learning to help with curiosity? So it's actually what I talked about. Thank you so much for that, for that question. To, to codify is to actually write down. And there is a, there is a neurological basis to, to actually writing things down where it gets even more so cemented into your pathways. So writing things down, um, journaling, that, that actual process of just sitting, and asking those questions that we had in the ponderings, and uh, Brian, uh, I'll, I'll, I'll kick it to you. We do have that handout that talks about those, those provocative questions and those ponderings that you can inculcate into your practices of your breath work, of your journaling and stuff so that you can become even more so self-aware, practice your reflection and just be curious about it all. And we will make that uh, handout available to you all when we send the email with the link to the recording along with the uh, PowerPoint presentations. We also will post uh, the link to the recording and these materials that Charlene has made available to us um, on our website within, again, by the end of the week, within the next 48 hours. So thank you all so very much for joining us. Uh, please stay tuned for upcoming webinars. As Brian mentioned at the beginning, we've got one in October and one in November. 
number and we would love to have you join us. Bring a friend, invite some colleagues, the more the merrier. Have a great week and keep up the great work. We'll see you soon.